Welcome to today's webinar. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps is a program of the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. This webinar is brought to you thanks to the contributions of colleagues and partners in Wisconsin and across the nation, with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It is produced in collaboration with Healthy Places by Design, an organization that advances community-led action and proven strategies to ensure health and well-being for all. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dejo since time immemorial. UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. This webinar will be recorded. All speakers' views are their own. Guest bios and slides from today's webinar are available on our resource page. We will share a link to the resource page when the webinar begins. Stay up to date on all things CHRNR. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if you haven't already, sign up for our newsletter by scanning this QR code with your phone's camera. It's the best way to find out about upcoming webinars, our podcast, and our latest tools and resources. Your facilitators today include our host, Erica Burroughs Girardi, with support from CHRNR Communications Specialist, Colleen Wick, and the Collaborative Learning Director from Healthy Places by Design, Joanne Lee. We invite you to continue the conversation immediately after the webinar in our discussion group. Joanne Lee will be our lead facilitator. And watch for a chat from Colleen for details on how to join the group after the webinar. Welcome to Innovative Partnerships to Address Mental Health. Hello, my name is Erica Burroughs Girardi. There is so much that we could talk about and learn about mental health. And this webinar has been a long time in the making. Today, we're going to be looking at one of the most important ways that public health can respond to mental health challenges, and that's through partnerships. For too long, when we've thought about health, we've kind of exclu excluded mental health, whether that was just like consciously or subconsciously. But mental health is a critical component of public health. Here at County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, we um, believe in the need to take care of each other. We know that we need to make sure that everyone has what they need, not just physically, but also mentally. Our well being is connected to the health of our planet and other living beings who share it with us. So hold that thought in mind as we prepare ourselves to learn today. And I wanna share that CHRNR's webinars reflect the values we hold as part of the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. Values of collaboration, integrity, excellence, innovation, inclusion, and courage. These are values that we aim to model during the webinar and we hope that you will too. With that, I'd like to introduce you to the team that's gonna aid in your learning experience. And I'll start with Joanne Lee with Healthy Places by Design. Hi, Joanne. Hello, Erica. Hello to you and everyone in the audience. I'm really glad to be here today and so glad so many folks have joined us. So folks, today during this live webinar, my role will be to monitor the Q&A box. So at any time, if you have questions for our presenters or our hosts about the webinar topic, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box and I will be queuing up questions uh, for the live Q&A portion of this webinar. Just a note for folks that we probably won't have enough time to address everyone's questions, so we will have to do some prioritization. Um, however, if you have a great question that maybe requires a lengthier answer, we encourage you to come over to the discussion group because that's where we'll have more time to kind of unpack deeper issues related to today's webinar. Right now, I want to introduce you all to Colleen Wick, who's going to tell you more about her role in today's webinar. Thanks, Joanne. Hi, everyone. Um, like Joanne said, I'll be in the chat. Please use the chat to share knowledge or respond to questions we may ask you. Join us in making the chat. 
space welcoming by adhering to the guidelines that were shared, share successes, lessons learned, relevant resources, and links. Please engage in a respectful dialogue. Our chat conversations tend to be very engaging, so if they are too distracting, simply close the chat window in Zoom. Again, if you have questions for the panelists, make sure to use the QA box. And now I will pass it along to our technologist, James Lloyd. Oh, thank you so much, Colleen. Uh, as, as Colleen said, I'm the technologist for our uh, webinar today, and I'm here to try and make sure that everything works as well as possible. Uh, if you do have a technology issue, please reach out to me in the question and answer pod. That's the best way to get our attention since our chat moves along so quickly. So I, I hope we all have a fantastic conversation. And uh, Erica, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, James. And yep. thanks to the entire team. You guys always make uh, these experiences each month so wonderful and welcoming and learning experiences too. 90% of adults believe that we have mental health, a mental health crisis in the United States. And more than half have identified mental health issues among children and teenagers as being in crisis as well. And this is according to a CNN and Kaiser Family Foundation poll that was published last year in October. You may have read the read this study. And one of the reasons why 90% of Americans think we're in a crisis is because, in fact, one in five adults have experienced or are currently experiencing some sort of mental illness. That means 20% of us here in this room have experienced or are experiencing some form of mental illness, such as depression, anxiety, substance use disorder, or other you know, um, conditions or disorders. And that's okay. The important thing is there's, we can learn more about this so we can all heal. Now, it's no surprise that the, the pandemic worsened mental health. Social isol isolation exacerbated depression and anxiety as people worried over health concerns or their finances. And we also saw incidences of substance use and suicide reach record highs over the past few years as people struggled to cope with the trauma of the pandemic. So if you are a public health practitioner, you know the value of partnerships. Remember, we talked about this last month with our webinar with Dr. Sandra Galea. And I absolutely love this quote from Justin Baker. He said, not everyone's a cardiologist, but a lot of people are trained in CPR. You know, we don't have to be experts in mental health to support opportunities for healing. That's why partnerships are so key to managing the mental health crisis in the United States. And we have two wonderful guests that are gonna help us understand what effective mental health partnerships actually look like. First, please join me in welcoming Dr. Shamila Khan from the Boston University School of Medicine and the Boston Medical Center. Hi, Shamila. Hi, thanks for having me, Erica. Oh, thank you for being here. And join me in welcoming Kimi Anna Tikam, Executive Director of Maine Resilience Building Network that they call MERBIN. I think that's such a cute acronym, MERBIN. <laughs> Hi, Kimi. Hi, thank you for having us. Thank you. I appreciate uh, you being here as well. And please be sure to read about our guest's impressive bios by visiting our webinar resource page. Colleen's already chatted it out once, but she'll probably chat it out again so that way you can grab our slides and grab the bios. Now, here are the questions that we're going to kind of cover today. Um, I shouldn't say kind of, because we actually are going to cover these questions with our guests. But what are elements of innovative mental health partnerships and how are partnerships helping to expand care to youth and adults? And then I will also be sharing toward the end of the webinar, some CHRNR mental health related data and strategies and, and you know, like where you can find strategies. And then like Joanne mentioned, um, we are gonna have our traditional discussion group that will be right after this webinar so we can unpack more of what you're hearing today. So please plan to continue that discussion um, with us. You probably heard us describe it a bit, a bit about it in the, the video intro as well. 
but the discussion groups are facilitated by Joanne. They're always engaging. They give you the opportunity to learn from others as well as share what you're doing in your community. So Colleen's gonna chat out some information toward the end of the webinar about how you can join that group. And our guests will also be joining us. So I'm excited about that. So now I'm gonna ask Shamila to meet me back at the mic because um, we wanna talk about what does effective partnerships look like when we want to address mental health? And, you know, one of the most important partnerships that we need to consider is opportunities for training, for provider training. Um, can you share how the Center for Multicultural Training and Psychology is using innovative approaches in training future mental health providers? Sure, okay. Um, so the Center for Multicultural Training in Psychology is actually the oldest uh, psychology training program that's focused on multiculturalism in the nation. We've been here for 50 years. Um, innovative in the sense that, you know, we have shifted and come a long way in terms of having these conversations um, 50 years back, um, up until recently, and to the George Floyd events. Conversations on this topic were, you know, met with um, resistance, um, as the slide shows. When you're in deep stuff, uh, look straight ahead and keep your mouth shut and say nothing. There's a fox in between that's hiding away. And, you know, I think conversations on multiculturalism, diversity, equity, inclusion, or mental health as it relates to that have been as such that people often don't wanna engage in those conversations or they feel hesitant or they feel like they will be judged or their opinions will be biased. So out of that fear, they resist having conversations on that topic. Um, so what the center does is actually, instead of having it as a side conversation when you're training providers or clinicians, it centers this. Mm -hmm. So not only do you train clinicians how to provide clinical work, but do so in a way where it's at the center of the table, uh, where it's done and created and done in a space that feels safe, yet also brave enough. So that includes um, responding, having responsive healthcare approaches. So in order to care for someone, I must know who I am. Um, in order to care for someone, I must know who the other person is. And to care for someone, I must be able to bridge the gap between myself and the other. So as mental health providers, we are the agents of change. So it's critical yeah. that we know who we are, right? So I am a Pakistani American cisgender heterosexual woman who's a woman of color and first generation immigrant. And I've lived in three continents, speak seven languages. These are all parts of my identity and they inform the way in which I understand and make sense of the world. So it's important for me to understand that. And it's important for me to understand that aspect or multiple aspects of identity of the other people that I'm working with and understand that complexity. So this means, you know, moving away from the traditional models which are embedded in cultural competence. The idea that you need to understand people from different groups and be competent in knowledge and awareness about how these groups operate. So we moved away from that model to thinking of it in cultural humility terms. Yeah. And then it moved to cultural responsiveness. The idea is to like look at people and understand them from these complex um, perspectives and incorporate competence and knowledge, but also be have humility in terms of how we make sense of others and have responsiveness. So that means committing to a lifelong process of self-evaluation. So we look at ourselves and what are what we're evaluating, what our biases may be, because we all have them. And to also look at the imbalances that exist between providers and clients, right? Mm -hmm. Very often there's a disparity, the number of providers who are people who identify as people of color are severely limited. And so we are often providing services to individuals who are highly diverse. So there are power dynamics that exist and be aware of those dynamics that becomes critical. And also like what we have been talking about earlier, creating partnerships, right? Um, there's a shortage of mental health providers. How do we engage in this in a way that um, partnerships can lead to more effective outcomes and people engaging in this? So there's a link to the article where I talk, talk about it in more detail that you're welcome to look up. Oh, yeah. And we will have that in the resource guide, by the way. And Shamila, I love what you're saying here. I love that, you know, cultural competence was fine. You know, we it was something that we probably most of us in this room have heard about being in the public health space. But I love the fact that we are now recognizing that we need more than that. We need to be looking at ourselves. We need to learn how we interact with other people and, and know that there's a power imbalance, not ignore it, but how do we manage it? Because there is one. And then the, again, 
we can't emphasize enough partnerships, 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 that that's key. Yeah. Um, you know, oftentimes we talk about the social and environmental determinants of health, but, you know, we're not only talking about physical health, these determinants kind of extend to our mental health as well. What are some of the social and environmental influencers of our mental health? Yeah, um, you know, just the way you were saying, I think in order to understand people, it's not about understanding people internally as individuals, but how they are part of families, they're part of systems, they're part of structures, societies, and context, right? So that context is important. So a person's health is influenced by a whole lot of factors. They're, you know, genetic factors, you know, who they are, their identities, right? And then think of things that they engage in, smoking, physical activity, that all kinds of things that are out there. But more importantly, the conditions, yeah. where people are born, grow, live, and work. These include networks, socioeconomics, cultural environment, and health systems. It's important to not forget those. And, and let's talk about, you know, a lot of, when we talk about social determinants of health, we have frameworks, right? I mean, we, even the county health rankings and mo rankings model could be considered a social determinant framework. Um, but you argue that those social determinant uh, so, social determinants of health frameworks need to evolve, and that that our partnerships need to think about the evolution of these frameworks. Tell us a little bit about how they need to evolve. Yeah, um, the social determinants of health frameworks often do not end up explicitly naming the systems of oppression which are the root cause of these disparities that exist in health determinants, right? So social determinants are connected to deeper and more widespread structural systems of historical oppression and discrimination. These include all these isms that are listed, right? Racism, sexism, ableism, xenophobia, transphobia, you name it. The institutional policies and theories created by these systems then shape the social determinants of health in ways that you know, place black people or indigenous people, people of color or other marginalized identities, LGBTQ individuals, undocumented individuals um, or other marginalized communities at a greater risk for poor health outcomes. So it's important for us to sort of recognize these systems of oppression that are in existence and how they inform um, the social determinants of health, hence the policies um, and structures that are put in place that lead to the individual outcomes. So think of this, you know, um, I think uh, the recent Supreme Court decisions um, that highlight this, you know, these are all these recent decisions that have been made, the Roe versus Wade is gone, affirmative action is gone, the loan forgiveness program is gone, constitutional carry is secured, business religious freedom is secured. These are all the ways in which our systems um, and uh, determinants sort of impact uh, policies and procedures that end up back impacting individuals. And the people who are most impacted by these are often people or marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, a great example. Um, and I'm, I know one of the things that you, when you and I were talking, you were saying partnerships, if they're going to be innovative, they got to address both. Let's, I wanted you to kind of dig into this a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I think you know we have moved in the good in the right direction to the extent that we moved away from looking at individuals um, and thinking of context and social determinants of health. So the traditional frameworks they address the social determinants of health now, right? They, include, they address the poverty in order to achieve the large and sustained improvements in health outcomes. But the you know outcomes sort of the frameworks that we're moving towards that um, are more about the social determinants of equity. Mm -hmm. isms that we're talking about. We know of these isms, we think of those that have come into um, our frameworks more so, but how do we actually look at those and address those and recognize how they're, you know, contributing to these health disparities and how do they connect to the social determinants of health? So I think it's important to broaden the framework to think yeah. of uh, the determinants of equity in addition to the social determinants of health and how they're interconnected. Yeah. I, I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, mental health treatment is challenging. That's another issue that, or another way that, that partnerships can help. But 
let's talk about some of the barriers to mental health treatment that kind of keeps us in this crisis space. Yeah, I mean, as it's apparent, you know, I think you mentioned it already previously as well. How many people um, struggle with mental health issues, whether they're adults or children? One in five American adults have experienced it. One in 20 Americans live with serious mental illness. And only 50 plus will end up, you know, um, sort of addressing uh, their, their mental health needs are not met. Essentially, 27 million people. Uh, if their mental health needs are not met, what is getting in the way of it, right? There's right. Affordable Care Act, which requires medical insurance to provide mental health coverage, but the cost is still high. There's a lack of mental health providers. There's a shortage of doctors, but the shortage of mental health professionals is even steeper than that. 149 million Americans live in a federally designated mental health shortage areas. Wow. And those who have the greatest need of mental health treatment haven't been taught the stigmas or the signs of mental health and how to treat and how treatment can help. So there's not enough education about it. On the other hand, a person's own beliefs about mental health can prevent them from acknowledging their illness or seeking help or sticking with the treatment, right? Or they face risk of discrimination uh, based mm -hmm. on seeking treatment as such. Mental health disparities stem from a large lack of diverse representation of mental health field, language barriers, implicit bias. Like eighty-four percent of psychologists, sixty-seven percent of social workers, and eighty-eight percent of mental health counselors are white. Mm. People are less likely to seek help if they think their clinician cannot understand or empathize with their background and their cultural differences. It's important for us to note that. Yeah. And then there's that issue of stigma. Yes, that's huge. And as you can see from this recent research, you know, um, stigma ranks the last when employers list their top mental health priorities. Look at all of the aspects, but stigma is still at the bottom of the list. And it's so critical to address in terms of getting people to seek the treatment. So we have a long way to go in that regard. Yeah. So just to, to recap, when we're thinking about innovative partnerships, you've talked about the importance of training, that um, people need to understand who they are before they can actually provide um, care that is appropriate to their patients. We need to evolve our framework so that we are now looking at the isms and the systems of oppression, and we need to address barriers to, to mental health. So I love how you just have these really, really important components, because as we begin to think about what an effective partnership looks like, we need to think about that. How are, how are the providers being trained? How can we partner with, um, uh, with, with um, trainers or schools of, um, to make sure that uh, providers are being trained appropriately? How can we make sure we look at the isms and, and then how can we make sure that our partnership is addressing those uh, mental health um, treatment barriers? So with that, I wanted you to kind of share some innovative partnerships. I will let you all know, so Myla came to me like with, okay, like a Santa Claus list of different types of partnerships. So I will let you know, we have had to cut it down because she knows so many different, she has touched so many partnerships and has so many examples. We're only gonna share a few in the webinar, but she has promised that if you come to the discussion group, she'll talk, she'll be able to share a little bit more about the different types of partnerships that she knows about. But let's talk about um, the few that we that you brought to today's um, discussion. So I think, you know, one, it's important to recognize that our mental health system, of, you know, is embedded in a very Eurocentric framework. The idea of mental health is based on these frameworks. And I think when we're serving people from diverse backgrounds, we have to expand our frameworks and think of other ways in which we can engage individuals, right? Um, so one of the partnerships that we have had here at the Boston Medical Center is between the BEST team, which is emergency services team, um, and we've created a partnership for behavioral health and racial justice, um, where a community institutions, like we're collaborating with the police department, Boston public schools, and the court system. 
So our program comes in and provides trainings on implicit bias and anti-racism for enforcement of law enforcement officials, first responders, school safety officers, and get people in the same space in terms of how they're struggling, how do they make sense of mental health, how do they recognize that somebody's struggling with a mental health okay. issue, and how do we make referrals, how do we collaborate with each other to make for more effective outcomes, how do we connect. So it's been really amazing to see these individuals from different backgrounds and not mental health providers learning about mental health and yeah. learning about the system of oppressions and how we may be biased in our ways of engaging with individuals. So it's been really um, amazing to work through one of these partnerships. And then there are multiple others, like uh, Eric, I was mentioning, there are probably more than I could speak to in this time frame. But um, one of the other ones during the COVID has been that many of us as mental health providers were in the front line in the hospitals and were struggling with our own mental health issues, right? It takes a toll and we needed that help. So what we ended up doing was adopting the buddy system from the military, uh, which is the buddy battle system that they have had, where two people collaborate with each other when they're providing services for someone, you know. So we, for instance, our chaplains collaborated with us as mental health providers, and the two of us would provide services together when there was a loss. If we lost another person to the um, pandemic, we would connect with each other, provide the support for each other and connect services for those families who had lost members in terms of providing chaplaincy services, to providing mental health services, other resources. So all of us from different disciplines came together to provide those services. Wow, that Similarly, is so awesome. Yeah, I mean, I could go on and on talking about all of these, but some of them- And I didn't, mean, I didn't mean to cut you off, I was just no. saying it was just so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, so you know, one of these has been uh, when I was in Pakistan after the floods and the earthquake, um, we were working primarily with women who were enduring more abuse and domestic violence uh, support was needed, but these women were often not coming into spaces to seek the mental health services and support. So what we started recognizing was that many often, very often these women go to these beauty parlors and spas and that's the space where they're all women and they're connecting with each other and talking about different aspects so we started to infuse ourselves into those systems and started having these conversations and lo and behold it became a support group over time but we would call a support group but women more and more women come, started coming and having conversations in the space about that we recognize the importance of benefits of engaging with and collaborating with those individuals and have resources and materials that were provided in those beauty salons similarly we started one here for barbers. The individuals who go into these barber shops and are able to talk about what they're struggling with as they're trying to externally put themselves together, internally what they're struggling with comes out in those conversations that they're having while they're sitting at those chairs. So we started collaborating with barbers, helping them recognize the, the symptoms one may be struggling with and having materials available at a barber shops that they could provide to people who they're connecting with. And it's gone a long way in terms of getting referrals and people to come to seek the services. You know, Joanne and I were talking about how this is such a wonderful way to reduce stigma too. That's, right. that's associated with um, with mental health. What a cool partnership! <laughs> and you know, um, after the Boston Marathon bombings, lots of people were being targeted, and um, and we recognized that very often the people who were being targeted after that were the Muslim communities and they were not coming out to seek the mental health support that they needed. So we started collaborating with Islamic centers. So I started, started providing services within that space and getting people to share what their fears may be, what their resistance was. People weren't coming because they're not documented sometimes and they still needed the support. We've done similar things after the earthquake in Haiti um, where we collaborated with the churches and other uh, entities as such where people were gathering as a community to um, to get people to understand and educate them. So there are multiple others of this kind that I could speak to, but I'm going to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for um, just kind of helping us understand, like, what are those basic components of an effective um, or an innovative, I would, I would say, partnership. And these are awesome examples. I love it. Um, now, we're going to circle back to you for questions in a little bit. Um, but right now, I want to invite Keeney back to the mic because we're going to talk a little bit more about the work that you are doing um, to build resistance in youth. So Keeney, can you tell us about the Maine Resilience Building Network? I know you guys call it MURBAN. Again, I love that acronym. But what is your mission and what is it that you all do? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so the Maine Resilience Building Network is a statewide um, nonprofit. We focus on um, supporting and educating people around early adversity, but moving towards the focus on resilience and how do we promote and support that through partnerships and um, programs across the state. And um, our network, as we refer to us, we really are a convener. Um, we bring a cross sector of organizations together. It may be community members, faith groups, um, healthcare, um, social services people, um, our state um, colleagues that join us as well for shared learning, learning collaboratives, learning circles. Mm -hmm. um, and we focus in on these three domains in our work, looking at home, school and community. And you'll notice here that the larger cog is community because we really believe that the environment where people live as um, was just so nicely explained to us really does impact our overall health and well-being. And so how can we better support um, our youth and our families? And I know you at once shared with me that the prevalence of diagnosed anxiety and depression among youth in Maine is alarming. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, like the rest of the country, we are facing um, a mental health crisis in Maine, and we have seen an, increases, an increase in diseases of despair, um, an increase in substance misuse. We have the opioid crisis as an example, and Maine has a high rate of anxiety in children um, diagnosed, along with other New England states. And we certainly know that during the pandemic, um, social, social isolation um, has really contributed to this and impacts people living in very rural parts of Maine um, regarding access to services, school-based health centers, as an example, because of remote learning. Let's look a little bit at that data that we saw um, that, that prompted you all to take action. Yeah, thank you. So we have a data set, the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey. It's um, administered every two years in middle schools and high school. And this is the data I'm sharing today. People, um, schools and communities opt in to participate. And you can see here that over time, our mental health um, is worsening for our young people looking at high school data today. Um, again, we know that, and this was in 2021, so it's really not even young people who have lived through the full pandemic. Mm -hmm. We also have in this data set a question that we ask middle school and high school students, do you feel like you matter in the community to people in the community where you live? And again, this is a, um, a decrease from 2019. Um, and again, pre pandemic completely, uh, but only 52% of our high school students felt like they matter to the people um, in their communities and only 55% of middle school students. And we know that this is a general um, set of data that we're looking at right now. And we know from the data in Maine that there are other um, groups of youth, LGQ um, as an example, black um, youth, pe um, people of color, our native population report lower scores of mattering. Yeah, that, that breaks my heart to, to hear those, those statistics. And um, we're gonna come back to talking about mattering in just a second. But um, right now, I, I kind of wanna shift the, the conversation to um, average childhood experiences because we need to kind of understand that first then to talk about what you all are doing in the resilience realm. So I know many of us have heard about it, but can you just give us a real quick recap of what we mean when we say ACEs? Yeah, thank you. So Adverse Childhood Experiences is a, um, a study that was done that looked at um, three types of um, adversity in one's life. It looked at abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction were the three overall groups. And this was a score of one to 10. And this was a test or a survey that was administered before um, and had people look about their experiences in their life before the age of 18. And the study goes on to explain and show the correlation between um, a decrease in um, both mental health, well being, and um, physical health, our overall well being. So it's a really a landmark study, an important study to know and to understand. 
but now there's we are now looking at something new and yeah. that is positive childhood experiences exactly so it's not um what we have learned is that these positive um, childhood experiences are really incredibly important and actually have significant opportunity to buffer um, and to support positive um, brain development in real tangible ways um, and this is some this is referred to as the scale of seven so you might recognize some of these um, as protective factors but again recognizing how we're going to talk more about how these do impact and buffer long-term impacts of adversity and it looks like these childhood experiences um, when children have rather child good childhood or positive childhood experiences they feel like they've been heard and understood you know safety yeah. looks like it's part of it as well as being connected to family and community which i thought was pretty yeah. interesting so keep, yes keep in mind um this is very relational so much of this yes. is relational health yeah relation yeah. it's not necessarily a program right it's how we show up in community um through wor our work in cross sectors and partnerships to support people so um, what we have learned through these this P, about PCEs is um, if when you are seen, heard, and valued, and you have those um, positive experiences in your life, even um, what's reported is when you are an adult that they contribute to a positive adult outcomes of mental health. So you can see on this slide, even zero to two PCEs, um, adults reported that they had good mental health about 50% of the time. And if you were in a community or a family um, school where you had six to seven of those positive experiences in your life, adults reported 87%, almost 90% good mental health. That's so it's the investment of supporting people around relational health has a strong correlation to wellness later in life. You also, um, we think about, and people ask the question, well, what about adversity? You just talked about ACEs. So we know that there is an intersection of adverse childhood experiences and positive childhood experiences, and that results are still good. So even when um, people are faced with adversity in their life in childhood, um, with four or more ACEs, as this slide shows us, um, but they, they can still experience good mental health when they, had, when they have high levels of PCEs in their life. So yeah. what's important here, it's the positive childhood experiences, no matter how much adversity that you have in your life, really could be the tipping point to support you to have positive mental health later in life. Interesting. Yeah. So I take a minute for you to read this. Okay. Research indicates that the absence of PCEs may be more damaging mm. to long-term health outcomes than the presence of ACEs. Mm. So people assume that if we can eliminate ACEs, and it's important that we do work to do that, correct? That's really a part of our role, um, that it's gonna automatically result in good health outcomes. But that's not the case. For many right. people reporting low adversity, um, they still have poor mental health or relational health income um, outcomes um, than those that did not have PCEs. So this message here is the more PCEs in a person's life, long-term um, support for mental health. And we're looking at the study to even see the outcomes associated correlation to physical health. And so that brings us back to mattering because yeah. that's part of that development and part of that protective positive childhood experience. So mattering is being seen, heard, and valued. And mm -hmm. as Dr. Flett teaches us um, that it can be supported, right? And it's a very, it's an important key protective factor that we carry with us in life. It's different than belonging. We can be part of a team, we can be in a theater group, right, at the moment, but that isn't something we take with us in life. So mattering is if you're absent, you're missed, you're noticed, right? So again, thinking about how we um, are seen, heard, valued, but how we can add value. Um, and again, take this with us throughout our life. 
So the work in Maine, and I shared that data set with you earlier, and you saw the low scores in community of mm -hmm. mattering. Um, we, um, we recognize that this protective factor really can decrease stressful life events over time. It can support us in our learning. It can be supported and promoted in community. And it's one of the most important investments we can make in young people who, as they're moving through these transition times in their life as well. Um, and again, looking long-term by the research that we have now around PCEs, that's another protective factor. Yeah. And, and that kind of brings us to what we've, been, when, what we've been talking about is how partnerships actually bring value to this work, how it makes it happen. So this project began with a partnership. It sure did. So um, back in 2020, when we looked at the data around youth reporting that they matter in community, um, we reached out to our partners across the state and worked in our public health districts to listen. We held um, community conversations, thought leader roundtables, and listened to close to 700 people across Maine on what they thought mattering was in their community, um, where they um, saw opportunities, where they saw assets within their community strengths as well. Um, so working in partnership, um, we heard that people wanted tools and resources to be able to support young people. So again, working in in partnership and across our network, we contracted with these five wonderful partners in Maine to help support us. Yep, through um, shared learning and helping us um, develop tools and resources. And these are youth serving organizations, but they also worked with youth within their organization. So we understood what mattering meant to young people. I love that. And so tell us about the resource that you end up developing. Yeah, so we have a couple of resources in our toolkit. I'd like to introduce the Maine Youth Thriving, a guide for community action. And again, this was developed and co-branded with the Maine CDC. And it really focuses on these eight keys in positive youth development and how we can support positive mental health. And you can work um, at any part of this book, or you can be bring a cross sector of people to the table to um, work through a vision at, at the community level and making sure that you have parents with lived experience, youth at the table, in addition to a cross sector of partners. So it's sustainable. We really believe that the work needs to happen at the community level um, for it to be sustainable. And we'll make sure we have a link for that too Thanks. in your resource guide. Now, Kini, Mervin is a network mm -hmm. and um, there's a role for so many different groups to play in this. Tell us about the sectors that are involved in the work and why, it's, why partnerships are just so valuable to what you do. Yes, thank you. So as we worked through work with our youth, we learned from them that mattering meant that they wanted to be seen, heard, and valued. That was their voice telling us, and they wanted to add value. Um, so we identified through our community conversations particular sectors that needed to understand youth messaging so they could talk adult to adult about mattering and be able to support um, to support youth in their community. So we identified these six sectors um, and we um, created communication sheets based on what the youth told us. And um, as an example, business bubbled up as an, um, a sector that youth wanted to feel more um, safe and welcomed in. They mm -hmm. wanted to be able to look for a career, um, have jobs, um, maybe know that it's safe and welcome to be there. Um, Parks and Rec is another example. You know, signage within our communities is green space welcoming for young people. Um, and how can we help um, school boards as another example, as they set policy and guidance for um, their schools where youth feel safe and welcomed and like they matter in their building where they go to school as well. So we have these communication sector sheets um, that are supporting this work within community on youth mattering and well-being. Nice. And um, again, 
tell us a little bit about the partners that help sustain this work. Yeah, so we have many partners helping us across the state. We're at different levels um, doing this work statewide. Um, we have contracted with a number of partners, and I'm highlighting a couple of a few here with you just to speak to the diversity of partners and how it comes about. So it may be just a rec department that's concerned about the health and well being of their young people. Um, so our, um, a coastal town, a fishing town, you know, is working to support young people um, in their mental health. We have um, a very rural um, set of communities that are um, working on youth mental health, working with youth groups, and really want to work cross sector within their communities so the adults can um, listen and lean in and learn what youth want so they stay and learn and feel welcomed in their community. Um, another organization um, is more urban, um, again, that are, we've been built, working with them to develop a vision statement. So they want to start on the Youth Thriving Guide and move through it, like set the table and bring sectors and family and youth to the table um, to really shift the culture in their community. Um, and, Interesting. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you did you no, have something? No, oh, that's okay. fine. Thank you. I apologize. I didn't realize you were you were still talking. So what's about really? It. I think what's important here is we through our research um, with communication is what we learn from adults that they do want to be part of the solution. They want to lean in and help, right? And they needed tools and resources, and um, they want, and they really do want to engage young people in their community. But they need some help doing it. So we're looking how do we model it um, within communities across the state. And what the youth told us is they want to help their communities thrive. That they have great ideas, and we maybe listen to them, but we don't act on what they tell us. So they often feel unheard and dismissed. So they want us to take an active interest in them. And they do have issues that are really important to them. So we're fortunate um, through this research project to be able to hear not only from our young people, but what adults needed. I love that. I love the fact that youth are so important to these conversations that you're having and that you're making space for them to feel um, listened to, feel heard and understood. That's important to everybody, but particularly to our young people who are our future leaders. Now, before we leave, I, I want to remind everyone about that quote that I said earlier. Not everyone is a cardiologist, but a lot of people are trained in CPR, including me. Mm -hmm. I'm trained in CPR. So as you think about that quote, Kenny, how can we in public health ensure that youth matter? Yeah, thank you. So there's no right way to take this on. Just, just start. Um, mm -hmm. Say hello when young people are walking towards you. Excuse me, you see somebody um, with a fishing pole, ask them how fishing went. You know, did you catch anything? Um, maybe you put the um, LGB, the flag up in businesses to show that they're welcoming to um, LGQ youth as an example. Um, lean into them, ask them how their day is. So there's no place to start, but we can look deeper into policies and practices um, with our civic leaders and our business leaders, town councils to really see what is getting in the way from young people thriving. So really the behavior start, change starts with us and um, I just asked the young people or yeah, everybody that's here today um, to pause and think about how they can change the trajectory of a young person's um, life in such a positive way through just engagement and smiling and saying hello. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much, Keeney, and such interesting research that you all are doing um, there in Maine and finding ways to, to, to make um, youth feel in, uh, heard and understood and part of the community because they are part of the community. So, you know, you might be thinking about, well, what does mental health look like in my community? I want to encourage you all to visit your county snapshot today because we have a number of measures that address mental health and you may not recognize them before. I have a list of some of the measures that we that are available on your county snapshot so you can see what mental health is kind of looking like in your county. So be sure to visit your county snapshot today. And then also take a look at what works for health. That's our tool here at County Health Rankings and Roadmaps that connects you with from a topic or an issue of concern 
with strategies that can address it. And we have 99 strategies that somehow touch mental health. So be sure to go to What Works for Health. Just put in mental health as the keyword and you'll see a number of strategies that pull up. And then also, you know, you heard a lot of, uh, heard Shamila and Keeney talk so much about connection, that social connection. I want to remind you that just last year, July of 2022, we did a webinar about making social connections for community health. I think this might be a webinar that you want to revisit, or if you haven't seen, make sure you watch it. There were some really good tools that came out of that webinar as well, and we are putting them on the resource guide because they're relevant to today's discussion as well. Now, just before we get to our question, I, a question and answer period, I want to launch, ask James to launch this poll because I want to know if you feel like some of these strategies that you heard today in terms of developing innovative partnerships could be used in your community. This is a nominate anonymous poll. I got the word out, but we're just curious about how well this, the content may have met your needs. So just let us know. And um, James, I'm going to ask that you uh, close that poll in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you so much for responding to that poll. And Joanne, um, please tell us what questions have come up. A wealth of questions have come up because our uh, both of our presenters have done such a great job of getting our thinking going around mental health and some of the really important and um, newer sub issues. So I want to invite Dr. Shamela and Kiniana to come back on camera, and I'm going to try to squeeze in at least two to three questions for each of you if Erica will allow me the time. And I'm going to start with Dr. Shamela. So Tessa and others really picked up on how you um, really emphasize the the influence of structures um, and systems on what's happening around mental health in our country. And so sort of related to the isms, uh, Tessa wanted to know whether you can comment about the challenges of healthism um, that impact engagement with mental health related services. So healthism defined as this idea that a person's health is really their individual responsibility. Yeah, I think, you know, um, there's the ways of thinking about about ourselves that are embedded in individualistic ways of thinking and the collective ways of thinking, but we are part of systems at large, right? We are part of family system, we are part of other systems at large, and the context matters. So I think, you know, uh, when we think of health isms and how we make sense of our health, it is partly how we are thinking of it, but how we're thinking of it is embedded in how we're connected to the rest of the structures and the systems and society and people. So naturally we're embedded in that, but we end up holding that, um, that regard, like that privilege of sort of determining how we want to address it. But the systems may not uh, respond to it in the way that we're thinking of it, right? Um, I'm just thinking of, I'm trying to think of an example. For instance, when we are, um, when we as clinicians are looking at a patient who comes in for treatment and they stop showing up, right? We would think, oh, you know, clinically what we're taught, oh, they're treatment resistant. Mm -hmm. What does that mean treatment resistant? Maybe they're not coming in for treatment because there's stigma about seeking this treatment. Maybe they're not coming in for treatment because the cost of coming to treatment is really high. Maybe they're not coming in to treatment because they don't have transportation to come into that. Mm -hmm. um, so there are all these other aspects that we don't think of. So how do we make sense of that? Um, is really broader than how we may individually be thinking of it. Um, right. All right. Thank you so much. So somewhat related to this kind of going more towards the what can we do, knowing that there are these systems that we're operating, you know, and that's part of our context and really excited because we have a public health student um, joining us and probably many more. But, you know, that person is really thinking about um, how addressing mental health contributes to prevention and control of other public health issues like chronic diseases, infectious diseases, things like that. And then Daniel wanted to build on that question and, and ask, so what can existing public health initiatives support? How can we better support and integrate mental health care services? Um, just, I know you gave some examples with law enforcement, but I guess specifically around public health. Yeah, I mean, um when we think of something like psychological first aid trainings, that has been a great collaboration between 
um, Department of Mental Health and Department of Public Health. So recognizing that mental health issues are prevalent and therapists are in lack, but people can be provided services in the moment by individuals who are trained in first aid, like just the way you're in first aid um, is, a, you know, anybody can provide first aid the way that Erica was mentioning. It's a mental health first aid. You could provide support by connecting with others in a way that doesn't go deeper into the need for a therapist. So I think there are mechanisms and modules of training and collaborating. We have a community healthcare workers who are collaborating with social workers, with public health workers who come together to be able to create more opportunities for people to engage with each other that are preventative in nature that keep them from getting into deeper spaces where additional help from therapists may be needed. So such such that's just one example, but other opportunities for these entities to engage with each other that are supposedly from different domains, mm -hmm. crossing those boundaries becomes pertinent. Yep. Thank you so much. So I may come back to you, Dr. Shamela, but I want to um, get in some questions for Keniana as well. So Keniana, people were just um, really excited about what's happening in Maine around mental health issues and particularly um, PCEs. And so Debbie would like to um, hear more about PCEs and um, want to hear what your thoughts are about sometimes even though you may have had good PCEs, it's still possible to have mental health problems. Absolutely. Um, so that is a good question. Thank you. So again, thinking about the environment that we're living today in as an example, or the social environment in isolation long term in the pandemic um, impacted the health and well being of all of us um, over the past few years. And I think what's important is to recognize that it's um, no one person, no one class, no one in type of individual can be suffering from mental health um, concerns. And it doesn't mean that it's lasts across life. You can just have a low day. So this relational health in the PCEs that I talked about can make a difference by acknowledging someone by name, asking them how they're doing, or just making sure that we're checking in on our elders, as an example, um, that we're looking across the lifespan to support everybody. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and so people's ears perked up too when you talked about mattering and how there's a slight, slightly different nuance to mattering, right? When we talk about mental health and belonging and everything, mattering is, is there's a special nuance to it. And so Shane wanted to know, and then Miriam was also very interested, do you have examples of mattering questions, um, you know, that are good for community folks to ask in their respective sectors or contacts with communities? And um, are you able to share valid, reliable questionnaires that you've used? Well, what we do have is the data and the information from the youth and that have we have developed these cross sector sheets or um, in communication, youth telling us that they want to be seen, heard and valued. So we do have communication sheets. Um, that we can share with people that have not been tested yet. Um, they've only been at this point um, created from the voice of youth, letting us know of what mattering is. Um, regarding like knowing a young person's name as an example, um, engaging all types of youth and really being aware of different populations of youth in your community and are they being represented on school boards as an example or on city council you know is it the same top 10 students at school that hold these positions so how do we work with more diverse groups of young people um, and again supporting families um, at the same time yeah thank you for that and so i want to stick with this um subtopic around communications and extend that to things like marketing and social media or community campaigns because Chris brought up a very interesting question that maybe both of you can touch on quickly because I see Erica coming back on screen but what it, what is the role um, of or, or how can we sort of also manage the communication social media and those types of messages to be more positive in addressing things like mental health and mattering and maybe we can start with um, Dr. Shmela and then add Kinney's comments. Um, I mean, this, to be frank with, there's been a lot of resistance in terms of the social um, media involvement from clinicians often, right? 
And that's a space where these conversations are taking place in a robust fashion. I think there's a need for clinicians to be more open and receptive uh, to the newer generation, to their ways of engaging, because the cultural dynamic is shifting around this, how people engage, how they connect um, and the borders. If we keep them stringent as such, we don't have access to a whole way of being and knowledge base. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done around um, clinicians being receptive to engaging in these formats and ways of, uh, of, uh, of being that, um, that the new generation is engaging. And I think we have a lot to learn from the new generation. Yeah. Kenny, any well, I comments? Guess I, yeah, thank you. I might add to that within healthcare in school settings, um, we do texting uh, time or social media messaging that happens. So maybe it starts with, I'm glad to see you today at your appointment, or I'm glad you came to school as an example. Um, so again, focusing on the positive and being more relational. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Erica, I know we're out of time, so I'll toss it back to you. Thank you both to our presenters for trying to get to as many questions as possible. Yeah. Come to the discussion group, though. We can ready to chat it out in just a second because you can see this is a good one. Um, click on the survey in the chat that Colleen is um, linking you to right now because we we really want your feedback and we do take all of your feedback into account as we plan our content um, and as we um, um, change how we do our webinar. So just make sure that you give us the feedback that's going to help us improve. So thank you so much for that. And I want to let you know that in August and September, we're going to do a two-part webinar series about a topic that is really, um, that needs some attention. I just put it that way. And we're gonna be talking about healing segregation for health equity. Segregation is a huge topic and we um, have elected to do two webinars because one webinar was just would not give it justice. I want you to plan to attend, um, join us on August 22nd and September 19th, where we're gonna be exploring segregation's link to health and policy and practices to heal from it. Now we're gonna kick things off with looking at the historical drivers of segregation and its threat to equity. We're gonna be joined by Dr. Tiffany Manuel and our very own Dr. Christine Muganda. And that'll be on August 22nd. Registration for that webinar starts today, I believe. So you can actually register for it right now. And again, we hope you'll continue the discussion with us in the discussion group. Colleen's chatting that out right now. So click on that link and join us um, so we can talk more with our guests. And I would love to hear about what you're doing in your community around partnerships to address mental health. Hope to see you there. Stay connected with us through social media and subscribing to our newsletter because that is the best way to find out about our upcoming webinars and, um, and what other tools that we may have to offer, including our podcasts and new things with What Works for Health. So I want to uh, thank Dr. Shamila Khan for joining us and Kini Anna uh, Tinkum. And thank you for sharing um, your wisdom with us. And thank you to all of you in the audience who do who work very hard, tirelessly every day to build equity in your communities. And I will see you next month. <laughs>